Good evening, this is Linda Abshaw from the Executive Director from the Brain Injury Association, Waterloo Wellington. Welcome to uh, a survivor story. Tonight we have Stephanie Woodstock who um, will tell you a little bit about her background. Um, Stephanie is uh, one of our board members and uh, very active. She's our secretary. Um, she was um, an intern with us when she was doing her master's degree. Um, just a very um, well-rounded uh, individual and I'm sure you're going to enjoy her speaking tonight. So I'm gonna pass this over to Stephanie who will take it away. If you have any questions, please uh, make sure that you send me questions in the chat and we will um, uh, gather those for, for Stephanie. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Let me just share my screen. There we go. There we go. You can all still hear me, right? Everybody is on mute. So I'm assuming that everybody can still hear me, but I'm gonna, I'll just keep start and then you can stop me if you need to. So my name is Stephanie Woodstock and um, I was just interested in looking at all the other survivor stories when I was preparing to do this one and I was watching them and they all seem to have a bit of a theme to them. So I noticed Paul Cleave, um, he talked a lot about mental health and um, I know that um, Kanika Gupta talked a lot about art as her process. So I was thinking what kind of theme I would like to um, talk about and I, uh, what came to my mind was advocacy. So I kind of thought that I would um, use that as my theme for my for my talk tonight. So this is my survivor story um, and I've titled it in my voice and that will become clearer as we um, go along. So I think um, also when I was looking at the stories, I mean it's obviously everybody has uh, a different story. Everybody's story is unique um but we all have you know common threads through our stories sometimes but um i just find storytelling fascinating because it really is a very a valuable tool we have for processing events in our lives and um so i find that really interesting storytelling just in and of itself is very interesting so i thought these survivor stories are so interesting um and I know my story today is very different what my story would have been this date last year. And it might be very different from a story I would tell um, next year on this date. So I'm aware of that. And I just think my story is today. My story is what I am feeling now. And um, I just thought I would go with that. So when I talk about my voice, I'm going to talk a lot about my experiences with um, the motor vehicle insurance slash legal um, process as a result of my car accidents. So I'm sorry if there are people in this group that can't relate to that particular situation, but I have tried to incorporate some information that um, is general enough. So I, I'm, I appreciate that you're still listening. <laughs> so that's nice. Um, so my story is about me reclaiming my voice that I felt I lost um, with the, um, through the systems that I was going through at the time and I felt very silenced and very um, just very suppressed and so now my story is about reclaiming my voice. So my story story is um, I was in a car accident six years ago, a little bit over. Um, I was driving with my husband and we were T-boned. Um, it was on a day like today, uh, the first icy day of the year, very snowy, very difficult driving conditions. Um, and it was uh, terrible. Um, I've put a little heart in, I've made this little heart and this is sort of a, a compilation of the things that I was doing at the time of my accident. So you'll see in there, there are things like public health nurse, I was doing triathlons, very type A personality. I was a team leader, I was doing budgets, and I was doing 
uh, like <laughs> everything at work. I was treating people. I was, you know, as a nurse, you know, I was doing medications and it's just uh, lots of different things. I was teaching at McMaster University. So I was doing like a million things. And probably now I think it's probably was too much, but, um, but also in that heart are things like friend, mother, daughter, um, sister, other things that are in there that I still am. So I kind of thought, well, I won't make another compilation of me now. Um, but I just know that if I were to do it, some of the elements would still be there from that little heart. Anyway, as a result of my accident, I was in bed for months. I, I was in bed probably for, I don't know, six months and then um, slowly started making my way so I could actually lie on the couch for a little while. And then, so over the past six years, it's been very, you know, like everybody, it's been a very long sort of journey. Um, my main symptoms were cognitive, uh, really information processing, like sludge, and very, um, very slow, uh, lots of um, organizational problems, scheduling problems, um, but also lots of vision issues, balance, memory, pain, in range of motion, my twisted vertebrae and my neck were all over the place. Um, adjustment to my new life was very difficult. Uh, speech issues, I, was, I had a lot of choppy speech initially. And, um, and then of course my mental health issues around denial. I was in denial for so many years. Um, grief, loss, anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder. It was just interesting listening to Paul the other um, uh, speaker we was talking about that. It's, it's just a very unpleasant um, thing to live with, but I'm learning how to do that. So in a nutshell, that's kind of where I am coming from. Um, and so then I've always been a positive person. So I, I always try to think of the things that my accident has given me. So I've had a lot of opportunity in my life. Um, I appreciate that. Um, this accident has given me the opportunity to slow down, to um, redefine my, myself in different ways, uh, lots of creative ways, which I didn't have time for or the inclination to do before, lots of writing, which I really like to do, getting to know myself, um, and learning to feel my pro way through a process, which I, you know, when you're doing everything all the together all the time, when, you know, my previous life, like I didn't have time to stop uh, ever. So this was kind of like a very much appreciated opportunity. Uh, what It didn't seem like that at the beginning, but I feel that now. Um, I did do my master's of public health at the University of Waterloo after my accident. And um, so I really took that on as cognitive therapy and it was really, I do miss it. I really liked doing that. It was a really good um, four year long, one course per term um, activity. And I, I did really like that. And um, I have had lots of opportunities to stand up for myself um, through the, uh, through what I have gone through since my accident. So I'll describe that a little bit more. It's, it's pretty, I think it's pretty interesting anyway. Um, so I say that I'm a positive person, but then um, when you are going through this insurance legal whole process, you start to not be, <laughs> to become less optimistic. It's very, very, it's a very difficult broken system. Um, because I entered into a lawsuit. I sued the person who, who hit us. We sued the person who hit us for loss of, way of you know, future income, for pain and suffering, for the loss my, my husband has experienced as a result of my accident. So we were knee deep into this lawsuit and rehabilitation process. And little to, did we know at the time what that would actually entail because we had no idea at the beginning what this would entail. So Michael J. Fox, I, in his new book, I don't know if anybody's 
read it. I haven't read it all. I've started to read it, but it's, he says, I'm just out of the lemonade business. I don't, there's no way to create lemonade out of this, out of this, out of this rehabilitation lawsuit practice, the process. Um, so this is where I technically feel like I really lost my voice. I was, I was lost in this, in this system uh, because I quickly realized that it, the system for um, getting your insurance company to pay for you, for your needs, for your rehabilitation is, is not easy. You ha I, I felt the only way we could do that was to sue. And quickly, you will realize your insurance company is not really there for you. They're trying to not pay. Um, they're trying to pay as little as they can for you. And it's a very demoralizing uh, process because they will have lawyers who will try to discount what you are experiencing and your own lawyers will send you to other people for um, to build up their case. And they, you come stuck in this dueling assessment world where you've got some people saying that you have no problems and other people saying you've got huge problems. And you're really lost. You're, you, it's like you don't exist. You've got stacks of papers on either side of, 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 of the sides, right? They've got all your medical information. This side's got all your medical information. And you're a voiceless person who's in this system that you have very to little to no power. So I found the system, that, that process of reclaiming the money for rehabilitation was worse than the accident. Like I just found it was very... Um, not very good. So there was no lemonade there. So I'm just, I was just part of this whole um, process for me was getting to the bottom, like absolutely losing my voice and then building my way back up to, 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 to find that again. So what I wanted to do over the next just a few slides is just kind of talk a little bit about some of the things that I experienced and I'm not going to like dwell on them it, 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 these are just kind of even just for just for the insanity of it I just wanted to to point some of them out the first one does not have to do with uh rehabilitation or sorry with the um with the uh um lawsuit insurance uh situation it's just another uh, um sort of situation thing that I had to deal with, but it's just kind of comical. So I threw it in. So um, I hope I'm making myself clear in what I'm trying to do, but I'm going to just start with this next one. So when I went to school and I had all my paperwork that said I was, um, I had a brain injury and the head of my department said to me, <laughs> like, if I help you, I'm going to have to help everyone. And so now it's just kind of a funny thing we always say in our house now. It's just kind of like, if I help you, I'm going to have to help everyone. And um, he also said it was a valid, what I was saying was valid. It was a valid excuse. And he would, he would do me the favor of letting me not come, but defer me for until I was better. And so this guy obviously had very little um, experience dealing with people who have uh, injuries. Anyway, I'll come back to that at the end and we'll just, I'll just explain a little bit how, about how that ended up. My first lawyer, my second lawyer is fabulous. First lawyer, terrible. Uh, worst, worst lawyer. And I'm sitting there in the office and he is just so excited. And he says to his coworker, this is great. Look at her. She's vegetative. This is a great case. And I thought, oh man, I should have known at that point that this guy was not going to work out. But of course, you know, we were not aware, not, we just kind of went with what we could find. And anyway, he lasted about a year and then we, we changed lawyers. So then in terms of the actual assessment, so this is, these are the people, these are the doctors and people who your insurance or like my insurance company sent me to um, the next series of slides are some examples of some of the things that happened in those. And so 
you have what are called friendly assessments, and then you have ones that are unfriendly. The unfriendly ones are the people from the insurance company who are trying to prove you wrong. And the friendly ones are from your lawyer who are trying to validate and make you like make the case that you are quite injured. So like I said, you're, you're in this dueling um, process. And I counted, I counted, I was sent to 26 uh, independent medical assessments in the course of six years. And so these, it, you know, it, and they're not people that are treating you. These are just people who are assessing you. So the, the concern is that some of these people are not uh, unbiased. So they're being hired by the insurance company. So you would assume, you know, so they're looking for ways to help their employer, the insurance company. And so it really technically inherently isn't a very unbiased system. So a couple of other ones I had were like my, this is one IME um, a psychiatrist, an unfriendly one. And he says to me, do you think you're fat and ugly? And I said, um, no. And he goes, do you think you have a brain injury? And I said, yes. <laughs> so he goes, well, if I told you that you were fat and ugly, you wouldn't believe me because you, you don't think you are. And if I tell you you don't have a brain injury, you won't believe me because you think you do. So it's all about what you, believe, what you think. And I'm like, what? Even with the brain injury, I'm like, what? <laughs> anyway, it's pretty funny now, but like I could tell you like, thousands of these it's just so funny like um and another guy another psychiatrist who was uh on the friendly side so he was my uh, working with my lawyer i fill out this depression inventory <laughs> he looks at it and he goes this is just a small version of like of the quote but he said you are not depressed enough you got to get back in there and try harder i am trying to help you you go fill that out again and you make yourself more depressed so I, I went back and I filled it out and made myself more depressed. And he comes back and he goes, okay, God, this is something I can work with. And I'm like, okay, well, that's great. So anyway, and a few other little pieces. And then I'm going to get off the, the, the negative end and I'm, I'll start <laughs> with the more positive stuff. Um, also in my experience, the highlight uh, or, or the very low light of my experience was that I had a speech language therapist, an unfriendly assessor, um, shared my entire medical record with a stranger. So that's anybody who wants to know that story, I'm happy to tell it. It's very funny. Um, I got IV meds without my consent in the hospital from a nurse. And I had a neuropsychologist. This one was unfriendly who purposely tried to um, uh, really upset me before a, psych, uh, a, a neuropsych assessment. So um, like it was just going through these experiences was just mind boggling. Like you don't know what is up and what is down. You just don't, you don't know where you are. You don't know how you feel. You don't know how you're supposed to feel. You don't know, like it's just, so you have to have therapy to be able to get through this whole experience. So it's pretty, I don't know, it's just fascinating to me. Anyway, so I thought about it and I thought, you know, I, I've got to do something because I just feel compelled that I've got to do something about these situations. So I've got to do something like this is just terrible for people to have to go through. And I'm sure other people listening or will listen or whoever else, has been through these too and knows what I'm talking about. I know, I know people I've talked to, there are people that know what I'm talking about, but anyway, so some of the things, this was the place where I had no voice. So then I started at this point, slide 10, this is where I'm starting to get my voice back. So I did some act, I did some things to help me. For each college, that was involved. So that speech language pathologist, I complained to the regulatory college. I sent a note as best as I could to say what she had done. And um, she was disciplined. They were, they found me correct. 
she had uh, in there was other infractions she had participated in and for some reason they told me what those were i don't know if they were supposed to do that but but they did anyway um so i thought great i was happy about that so the whole school thing about the guy who said you know if i help you i have to help everyone <laughs> Well, then I phoned the Human Rights Commission in Toronto, and I they have a free legal um, uh, service. So I just phoned and I said, you know, I've got this situation where I'm I have a disability, and they're not letting me in the school. And he goes, oh, yeah, that's not right. So they helped me with some communication for the school, and uh, which I sent, and the tune changed quickly when I said about the Human Rights Commission. They were they were very happy to accommodate me from there on in after the next four years. I got whatever I needed. It was great. Um, and to the end of that, I'm also sitting on three university, excuse me, three University of Waterloo committees now um, to help uh, turn that whole process around so that people who want to go to school aren't discriminated against because they have a disability and people who have that um, sort of um perspective need to be uh <laughs> need to be um have a process of their own to learn how to address to, to deal with students who have disabilities so i found that in order to be able to reclaim my voice i needed the right attitude I needed to be competent, which I had no confidence at this point, at the end of this whole scenario, and to be resilient. And um, I don't you love this? This is so cute. Dear world, you've done lots to try and bring me down this year, but I'm still standing. In your face, world. Sometimes you got to let the, know, the world know who's boss. So you, you just have to try to take something, even if it's one little small thing, and try to turn it around when you feel like you have been oppressed or discriminated against or um, whatever it is. It, it, I just feel like one little baby step towards resolving that situation can be very powerful. I took a few steps, but that was over time. One little step is all it takes to go in that right direction. So now I'm gonna focus on some of the things that have uh, really helped me in the process of reclaiming my my voice. Um, this slide, I've practiced these things over and over and over to become habit. Now, I don't say they're habit now, but that's kind of where I would like to be. So getting to know myself again, listening to what my actual thoughts are in different things, and then getting centered in, in order to sort of understand what those are and then you can take action from there meditation has helped me greatly in terms of calming my whole over system, my system down uh mindfulness trying to stay in the moment and not predicting future not ruining the past but just trying to be mindful today be mindful now and um, I find that's been very helpful. Of course, gratitude, you know, it's that lemonade. Like, I'm really thankful for the things. Because I used to say, well, this insurance, you know, system, at least I have the opportunity to be in it. Or I would try to say, like, I'm really grateful that I do have a lawyer that's going to help me. So I was still trying to to have gratitude for the things that that were really like were really playing with my mind so i gratitude is an interesting one because i do i have so much gratitude for things in my life but i realized there's that one piece that insurance legal place that's not where it is um it, it i'm i'm grateful that i have an opportunity to reclaim my voice after it but it um yeah it was quite quite difficult to grapple with that one I have an awareness of myself. I have an awareness of, um, I don't know, just my uh, situation. My, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to terms with that. Slowing down and 
appreciative inquiry. So looking at things and wondering and being curious about things from an appreciative uh, perspective. Um, the other thing is to try to, I always try to say like, you know, you're building the confidence and you're reminding yourself that I do matter. This is not a system that is um, going to build you up and you're going to be aware of that, but you have a lot of important parts of your life that are, they matter to a lot of people. So you'd like, you really do matter and that I'm important and that I'm capable of great things. And it's very hard to remember that when you are in a very toxic system, but um, it's possible and making a word cloud, which, you know, you know, I love making word clouds um, of the positive things that people have said about you. This has helped my confidence too, where you just put the things all in one place where people have said good things about you. Keep track of those, write them down, put them in a word wall, a word art. And you can just look at that all the time. Like you're more resilient you know, you're awesome, you shine, you know, you think, oh, I need to see that someday. Some days I need to be reminded of that. So I'm very happy to, um, you know, have, ha you know, just doing that has been very helpful. And I do that for other people as well, where, you know, you can sort of like see people and, and I, I think in terms of words. So anyway, it works well for me, but I just really find that those things have helped me with my, um, confidence and um just overall feeling feelings of resilience and um yeah so that's been very helpful the other one uh, don't you love these powerpoints like i didn't realize you could do all these slides like this like i i was making this and i was having so much fun anyway um I love this picture because it does, it says, find your people. These are the people that are gonna understand what you've been through and know what you're talking about. And people who've been in, car, like in my case, people, other people who've been in car accidents, who have gone through this horrific, uh, you know, uh, uh, process. It's just nice to know that there are people who understand you, get you. Those are the people you stay with and you stick with and you, you have in your life. And that also will really greatly help your um, confidence and um, and resilience. Just just being able to have that foundation really has helped me uh, better define my voice and be able to reclaim it and understand that no matter what, I'm supported, and that's just really important. So um, that's been very very helpful for me. And Donna, there's my dog. This is Ruby. She, <laughs> she has a best friend. It's over there on her right side. That's her little, um, her little um, uh, lamb. You trust in those who believe in you unconditionally. So these are people who are just going to be there no matter what. So you can, it's just to be able to get through this particular kind of process or any kind of process, like any kind of, of negative process is really important that you, you just stick by the people that really believe in you unconditionally and just know that you are important and you're not going to get that validation through a lawyer or through an insurance company, or they're not going to do, you know, the kinds of things that are in your best interest, even though you think they originally, that you, that they might, but, those aren't the people that are your people. These are the, these are the people, your dog, your, your little um, friends that can, that just, you know, yeah, you spend time with, with those. So in the end, um, another fun slide with PowerPoint. Um, I think it's really important to when I was saying before about taking a step because there's going to be other people that are like me who have had very unfortunate situations who have been you know don't feel they don't have a voice they feel like they've been discriminated against and and discouraged in different ways and 
feel oppressed. And it's just really important to, even if you feel like you can't, there's nothing you can do. There's always something you can do. There's always one thing you could do to help move in a direction. And so I always think it's important to take action. Once you've figured out what actions, what, what things are really bothering you, um, to be able to find your voice and be able to work with that is just one step at a time and um, not giving up to find, uh, to trying to find solutions to problems and um, getting help when you need it and being vulnerable and asking for help. So these are all things that in, in doing them has helped me feel more confident and able to take on some of these bigger issues that have really been uh, been very annoying um, to me for the last six years. And I should say that um, I am now out of that process. Like my, my claim has been settled. I, I have no more uh, assessments that I need to do. I don't have any further um, toe in that process. So I'm very happy about that. But it was unfortunate because it really had to end before I could actually take on some of these, um, some of these bigger issues. And um, some of them, I, you know, was, it was earlier than now, but some of them were very recent. And um, I'm still in, in some of the processes of, of dealing with those. And um, but my feel like my voice is much louder now. So now I feel like I I can really, you know, at the at the risk of being like complaining all over the place and being very negative, I feel that's different than using your voice and standing up for yourself and self advocating and um, helping yourself. Um, uh, and I felt compelled to do that, and I feel like. I will continue to do that until I feel that it's kind of exhausted. I've exhausted that. So um, yes, take action and, and do something. And what I was going to say also, yes, is to just be very proud. I have a brain injury. Like there's nothing, no shame, no, nothing to hide. And this is like, you need to treat me this way. You need to be, um, uh, aware of that and you need to be respectful of that and you need to not discriminate against me uh, you know um, and so you just have to be very proud and it's difficult I I know that I um, you know not every day you feel that uh, very strong some days on the days you do feel strong you could maybe take some of this on but it's um, you know it's it's just a, a place of strength that you can come from and i think that's important so my last slide is my um my last slide is now my voice is very loud i feel like i have uh been given the opportunity to be very loud now and i'm very happy to um talk with anybody about my situation because I, I know other people might be going through it and I'm happy to if anybody calls me or emails me or anything I you know I think we need to um, it's a good way to talk to each other about the situations we're going through and um, just really know that we understand what that means and um, that's that's very important to connect and I know it's hard to connect now but like we can still connect you know email phone and any any way anybody wants to call talk talk to me I'm, I'm very happy and approachable to to um, to do that so I I will leave it at that I have no other slides that's fine thanks Stephanie um if you want to um, unshare those yeah and then we can um, take some questions. I've got three or four questions here. Hey, love the uh, question. one, one is around, uh, you made a, uh, a point about uh, your lawyer and, and having about a, a year with the first lawyer. How did you know that it wasn't a good lawyer? Like, what did you use? Oh, to I love that question. Um, okay, 
so this is what I have learned. Why? Okay. So I, the, I mean, he was very disrespectful to me initially and I didn't, I just didn't even think that was a thing because, um, I just thought that's what you had to deal with. But I realized afterwards that he was also a lawyer that was not willing to, he was a settle early guy. He was, had no interest in going to trial because any good lawyer will tell you that, that you have to prepare for a trial throughout your case. You have to just assume you're going to trial. And this guy was not interested in trials. He was a, he was a, uh, let's get this. It doesn't, didn't he, he's into taking a lot of different cases and settling early as opposed to doing the best for you and getting all the way to the very end and, um, and really getting you what you deserve. So, um, there was a lot of little things. They had a very small office. There was no paralegal support. It was just the lawyer and his wife. And, um, there was no ability, you know, all the emails and all that, you know, you didn't, my, my strong recommendation would be go to, to use a firm that's got, you know, a bigger firm, well-known, lots of lawyers, lots of paralegal staff. Um, not, not a really small firm that will go the distance. Right. And we've got a few on our, um, directory that we, you know, yes. we recommend. Yes. So Those are good examples. Yeah. Yeah. Those are good examples of ones that are well known and, yeah. and, and are really are, you know, willing to do what's right for you. Right. Yeah. Another question here is, are you still going for counseling? Do you still feel the need to do that? And um, maybe share a little bit more about, you know, not what you're talking about at counseling, but what, you know, what, what do you, what do you think you're still needing to uh, resolve? Cause, cause the accident resolution is one step. What, what are you kind of thinking that, that uh, still needs to be um, discussed and, and any guidance you can give for, for people that are doing that? Well, that's a good question. I, um, when my lawsuits uh, resolved, I had a total aversion to any therapies and I've been seeing a ton like, you know, excuse me, OT, speech, physio, massage, osteo, vision, like a million therapies. And I, I just, the only one that has been, that has, has been through the whole time and still continues is counseling. Um, my big issue with that is the sort of um, adjusting to the adjustment to not only going through the process of the legal system and all that stuff, but also you're, you're adjusting to a new life at the same time. And um, for me, it was the perfect storm of, you know, like going through this very stressful process, dealing with the accident in my mind, and also I'm trying to figure out like, okay, now I have like a no, my old life is gone. So I still love counseling because it's really helpful to do sort of a talk therapy, helps you process all of this stuff. And for me, I don't know how long I'll do it. It just, I, I really do appreciate um, that kind of support. And that's the only one I'm doing right now because okay. I'm taking a break. Right. Um, before you took a break, which treatments did you, would you say really helped you the most? Hands down speech therapy, hands down. Uh, it was great because she was doing stuff with me for like not only speech, but organization, executive functioning, communication, communicating with the world, uh, hands down her, she was, you know, just fabulous. And, and my rehabilitation therapist was also very good because she was helping me increase my tolerance to exercise and my uh ot was helping me with things i can do that will not work so um speech counseling okay okay in order the top four counseling speech uh, rehabilitation therapy and OT. Okay, great. So this is a question I've asked you before. So 
hopefully you'll answer it this time, but. <laughs> oh gosh, what is it? <laughs> so Stephanie and I used to spend hours at the coffee shop and um, oh, we, just had... we, we'd look up and go, oh my goodness, we better get home to make dinner. Um, but, but the question that came from someone else, not me, was what are your plans with your master's degree? Well, that, I do remember you asking me that question. <laughs> Um, well, I, the reason I don't have a really good answer for that is because I don't, I have no idea. Like I'm not going to be working. I ever. Um, so I have to be creative and think of ways to use that. Cause I, I mean, really, I didn't take it for any other reason other than just to have cognitive therapy. Like literally the courses were very, there's no exams. It was all, you know, really spaced out. It was just, I really didn't take it for any other reason than because that was always my plan. And I, I, so now, as you know, I'm doing some writing. I'm, um, I don't know. I have no idea. Like what I'm kind of just going day by day and doing things that I find interesting. Right. Um, you haven't talked much about your, your family. Uh, you've got two kids and uh, a husband what what was the impact of this on on them and and what did you as a family do to um stay sane stay connected um and and how's that going well we were actually pretty lucky because my accident happened the year the, the it was the it was it was november um and that two months before september was the first time both kids were out of the house and they were at school so it really actually was good timing that way because I was on the couch for months or in bed for months. And it was a slow realization for them that this wasn't just like a quick little thing. It was going to be a lifelong, you know, career loss kind of situation. So they actually have been slowly learning about the new me, just like I have. And um, they're very supportive. They're very great kids. And same with my husband, like he's very supportive too. Um, and so, yeah, just as a family, we've, it, it, it's not, it, we're still close. Like, um, but we, you know, I don't feel like I, I know I've had talked to other people who's, you know, kids don't understand and, you know, they don't always understand everything, but just the broad strokes, like they just, they, they right. kind of understand. Yeah. Right. A um, couple more questions come in, in, in here. Oh, I love questions. <laughs> so in terms of less f focus on your physical therapies, um, was that just because the, the tort was, was complete that you said, I'm not doing this anymore? Was there actually a time that you said, I, I think I need to accept where we are right now and that these therapies are necessarily helping me well it was really interesting because i was kind of this pandemic has really helped me with that because in march i was doing a full tilt um and at that time i was talking with with my providers and i was saying like you know at some point some of these therapies are not going to be as helpful like i had to scale back i was crazy busy with um with appointments so um, at that time, even in March and April, I was kind of thinking, okay, now what therapies would I like to keep? And what do I not, what do I find less helpful? So all of the physiotherapy that I've had for my head and my neck and my spine and all of the osteo and all that stuff, I kind of let that physical stuff go because, um, I was really focused on my cognitive. That was the thing that was really. Oh no. So I stayed with those. And then um, even those with the pandemic have dwindled. So now I'm on a hiatus for three months and I'm going to decide, uh, you know, after that time, what I'm going to go back to. And it's going to be a really much smaller than it was. Right. Combination of, of COVID then and, and uh, yeah. where you are. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Uh, you're, you're lucky at the other end then, you know, you've got kids at the beginning and now COVID at the end to help with, with tapering off. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. There was a question here about um, acceptance of the new me and how hard that is for some people um, knowing either that this is the way I'm going to be for the rest of my life, or this is how I have to be right now. Um, you know, you talked a lot about 
some of the positive things to do that, but, but really what, um, you know, how, how long did it take to kind of get through that transition of really accepting the new realities? Uh, it took a while. And like I said before, I was in denial a lot of the time. Like I didn't realize that I was in denial because I would go to my th therapies and all my groups and all my stuff. And I'd always think to myself, you know, I'm here with all these people and I have nothing in common with them. Like they have all these problems and I don't even have anything. Like I, I was in real, like serious denial. I was like, I, I'm just going to do some of these exercises and I'm out of here. <laughs> Like, so that was the first year. And then slowly over time, coming to terms with, oh, okay, like, you know, I, this is, the, and it's just, it's been a very slow process. It's not done yet. You know, I still am in the process of, 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 of accepting that because I have and accepting sort of like, um, where I'm at. Like, I don't have uh, specific things. I'm like, I have things I'm doing, but I don't have like first this, then this, then this, then this. So I'm still in the planning process. So um, part of that is an acceptance process as well. But I think for the most part, it was probably about five years. And then now it's just kind of, you know, it's not, it, it, it's just moving along. I don't know if I'm answering it, but it's, it's moving along in the right direction, but it's taken a long time. Yeah. There's a question here about surveillance um, and the oh, company. Yes. So oh, it yes. stresses uh, some people out and, and I would say it stresses everybody out. I don't think there's anybody that likes it. Um, so were you told that there was going to be surveillance and how did that, uh, how did that work out for you? Um, this person feels like um, that there's nothing to hide, but it just feels weird because well, someone's, someone's watching you who who has an ulterior motive. So yeah, there's nothing. Uh, that's just it's just terrible. Like it's there's nothing worse. It's really um, to have somebody like infringe upon you like that, where you've got people like I've had people standing outside my house with the telephoto lens or um you know um uh, several times or um you know there's just been so many different incidences of that and it's just so um it just feels terrible it, it's it's i was told the very first meeting i had with my bad lawyer um he goes just live your life with the blinds shut because there's going to be people watching you and i i kind of I I had no idea what he was talking about. I didn't know what he was talking about. Um, so in the course of this time, yeah, we've had been surveilled all kinds of times and, and um, you know, followed to different places and, you know, like, um, and really in the end, it doesn't have any, it has very little to do with your whole court, like case. It really has such such so little to do and it just causes so much stress um and in the end it doesn't really matter it's not you know it, it's just a really unfortunate part of that whole process it's it's right. terrible right okay um i think that's about in terms of the themes one of the questions was really you know how did you keep how did you keep persevering i think that's the question is really perseverance and and what gives you the strength to do that um i think that um like i have an in, like i have an inherent drive that i've always had but that was kind of silenced during this process so i'm kind of like finding that again but um i think that drive comes from not looking at the whole problem and all of the issues all the time it's just like taking really small steps to do and that really is keeping going like that's what the definition of that is is just um persevering and keeping going and um you know pretty soon the next day turns into a week and pretty soon it's a month and then it's six months and now all of a sudden you've gone a year and it's just like you just keep you just keep going. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's really hard. And, um, 
but the next day comes and so it's just kind of keeping going yeah, you and I, you know I you and I used to talk about getting one thing done and getting it off your list and I think that's kind of what you were referring to is is that you know just take one small step and 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 make it happen so yeah because you don't need to take to do huge things like even little things are, are one small thing is an accomplishment in a day for me now um before it was 20 things i'd have a list so long and you cross it off and cross it off and so it's it's adjusting the expectations um for yourself and being okay with that and not judging yourself if you are not you know meeting those expe expectations it's all about um yeah like really just being okay with doing one or two things right right Okay, well, I'm going to um, take us off record. Thank you very much, Stephanie. It was very um, enlightening. Uh, we, I'm sure all of us can talk to you for hours. So let me just stop that and we'll uh, get to the open discussion. Hang on.